This week on Hindsight, President Uhuru Kenyatta of Kenya and Raila Odinga are back on the campaign trail. This is because Kenya's Supreme Court last Friday annulled the country's presidential election in a historic move with that has sent shockwaves beyond Kenya's shores. It is the first time this has happened in Africa. Now, shortly after that landmark judgment, Kenya's Supreme, uh, Kenya's President, rather, Uhuru Kenyatta, branded judges in the country's Supreme Court crooks. His ch uh, challenger called for the overhaul of the country's electoral commission. We examine the repercussions this could have on elections on the African continent on the program tonight. Also on the program, we'll take a look at the significance of last week's visit uh, of, of Britain's Foreign Secretary, uh, Boris Johnson. I am Shegun Ojumu. Welcome to Hindsight. On this program, we'll be bringing you news, views, and exclusive interviews with security that cut across humanitarian aid. It becomes easier to do business in Nigeria. Now, Nigeria. Now, the opposition hoped for it, but didn't dare believe it. The president-elect of Kenya, Uhuru Kenyatta, well, he didn't see it coming as Kenya's Supreme Court announced uh, the election he won. Uh, opposition leader and Mr. Kenyatta's challenger, the post, Raila Odinga, was ecstatic at the judgment. It was a vindication of his position that the poll had been hacked. Such a move is unprecedented in Africa's democracies. The court ordered fresh polls within 60 days, and now we understand that those elections are to be held on October the 17th. I will bring you Mr. Kenyatta, Kenyatta's reaction, because as expected, he was bitterly disappointed by that judgment. But before that, let's give you, let's bring to you what uh, Kenya's Chief Justice uh, David Maraga said as he delivered that judgment. The presidential election held on 8th August 2017 was not conducted in accordance with the Constitution and the applicable law rendering the declared results invalid, null, and void. My primary message today to every single Kenyan is peace. Let us be people of peace. Secondly, I take this opportunity also to say thank you to God. Because it is God who has brought us thus far. It is God that has made us a people it is God that has enabled every single Kenyan to have moved from his or her home and peacefully, peacefully stood in queues for many hours to make their choice. Indeed, it's a very historic day for the people of Kenya and by extension for the people of the continent of Africa. For the first time in history of African democratization, a ruling has been made by a court nullifying the regular elections of a president. Now, Mr. Kenyatta initially called for calm, as you heard there, and he said he would respect the ruling. But uh, later, he looked like he was spoiling for a fight, you know, in a, in a rally he held later that day in uh, Kenya. Uh, you, rem you will remember that the poll had raised fears of major violence, similar to that following the disputed vote in 2007. Although the unrest in this year's vote was not as serious as in 20, 2007, uh, days of sporadic protests left at least 28 people dead. Now, uh, joining me to discuss this issue further is Kachi Okezie. He's a, a legal practitioner 
Uh, he's also a management expert and a world affairs analyst. Thank you, Kachi. It's for a pleasure. Thanks for having me. It's great to have you on the program. First question. Yes. Were you shocked by this? How shocked were you? That's a question. By this judgment. Um, I was, I, I wouldn't say shocked. I was taken aback right. that it came in as quickly as it did. And to me, really, that is the story of this uh, you know, whole affair. Mm. Uh, because that really is what has been the problem in Africa, particularly in Nigeria. Mm. You know, um, the Supreme Court uh, responded. Look, people, are, uh, people have been saying all sorts of things about right. this. Okay. Oh, it's never happened in Africa. It's never. <laughs> Don't forget, in 20, I think 2011, right. was, we also had a lot of praise for our Supreme Court mm. when they stood firm, mm. you know, and came. Uh, you know, answer the national call. Mm. It's just that things trailed off after that. Right. And so uh, we have short memories in these things. Mm. And then uh, all the good work was forgotten. Mm. Now, uh, so very good news. Uh, it makes us proud as Africans right. to see that. Mm. And uh, it's also a test of leadership, okay. both on the part of uh, the, the, the winner you know, quote unquote, mm. Mm. of the election, mm. who had to do or uh, stand in the mold of a, a good luck Jonathan, <laughs> so to speak. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. But uh, questions have been thrown up. Um, Kenya has had, has shown good promise mm -hmm. concerning the whole issue of building institutions in Africa. Right. When, I mean, Obama spent his time in you that know, country, yeah. Yes, well, he spent his time making that call for Africans, mm -hmm. African countries. He went to Ghana, he said the same thing. Mm. He actually uh, made clear that one of the reasons he wasn't interested in, in Nigeria, Nigeria was <laughs> because you had no respect for institutions and you were not showing any interest in committing to building institutions. So I was not terribly surprised to see that Kenya has done that. And so it's credit to them, yeah. credit to the uh, leadership, whether, uh, you know, the, the, um, the w whichever way it turns, mm. Kenya is the winner mm. in this. Yeah. And as such, uh, we need to be proud of them as fellow Africans. Mm. The, 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 the thing about it is that the, the, the judges didn't just look at the election, they, they looked at the entire process. What do you say about that? Was that, was that uh, surprising for you? They looked at the entire process. No, no, because, it, you know, obviously uh, um, the court will respond to what was brought before it in terms of, mm. you know, the sort of application made before it. Right. They looked, because the argument was um, there, there were allegations of hacking, of hacking interference, mm. you know, um, similar to... Uh, in the US, what the, happened, what in, happened the in the US. US right. so, so this looks like the spirit of the age. It looks like this is what we're now going to be uh, dealing with mm. going forward. When you have yeah. electronic voting exactly. and collation so, and all of that. And also, um, countries that are contemplating introducing more uh, um, computer-based so systems and processes for elections need to now begin to do more robust risk analysis. Right. Okay. I know that Nigeria is um, mulling that. Yeah, mulling all of that. But mm. we, you know, we needn't use this as a reason not to, not to move forward. Right. Rather, um, as a caution, a warning sign that we need to realize that this seems to be what comes with the age and therefore prepare appropriately mm. for it. Mm. But I think the uh, fact that the decision came in, I think six days, yes. you know, was very impressive. Mm. But then let's not be unfair. I've read some uh, commentary. I've read some very sarcastic appraisals of mm. this decision. Yes, we praise it. We're happy. We love it. It's good for Africa. Mm. But that's right. not to say that uh, our systems are not, uh, um, you know, doing their job. Yeah. We have to acknowledge the situation that we have created. I don't, I don't know how many other jurisdictions in this world have more uh, docket load upstairs than downstairs. Okay, in most, uh, you know, advanced jurisdictions, mm. the appellate system is designed to do just that. Yeah. Here, therefore, a lot of matters are resolved mm. at lower level right. than the appeals. Interlocutory issues 
are resolved. In, um, I know that in Norway, in the, in the Scandinavian countries, okay. and uh, a lot of other jurisdictions, mm. they, keep the, they keep a lid on you know, processes and applications. You know? So people now get used to having a thorough day in court, mm -hmm. have your due day in court with fairness, mm. and when it ends, you shake hands, it's ended. Mm. It leave, you you leave it there. Up all the way. What happens in our system mm. is, I don't know when this began, but mm. that seems to have been the way we've gone, mm. that the system gets beleaguered mm. at the adversarial level when it starts you know, at, at the uh, sort of uh, initial level. Mm. And so when you get judgment, apart from one or two exceptions where you have summary yeah. matters that are dealt mm. with like that, all you now need to see is applications, injunctions, interlocutory appeals, and all of these things clog the appellate system. And mm. the appellate system is the one that needs to be freed up. The Supreme Court doesn't need to be engaged yep. around, the, you know, around the year. Mm. The it's Supreme Court is where you go when you need to go there and only when you need to go there. That is what we have departed from. And I think we need to do something really, really serious to look at how to uh, begin to um, dissolve issues at a lower level and get issues terminated there so that you control what trickles upstairs, right. you know, for, to the appellate uh, uh, um, jurisdiction, yeah. Okay, uh, before we leave the subject and move on to the next one, uh, let me put you on the spot and, and ask you, how important is it for whoever loses, or yeah, for whoever loses the election, which will be held on mm -hmm. October the 17th, to concede defeat? Because Mr. Rana Odinga has called for an overhaul of the you know, the electoral uh, body, mm -hmm. the gov, uh, the governor, and the incumbent uh, president says that's not going to happen. Yeah, but he too has also made a call uh, as well. For so peace. so they, they've both, they've actually both mm -hmm. expressed some critical views. Mm -hmm. Okay, he talked about, he's talked about the courts. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I'm not quite sure. The, 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 there's a particular term I hear that he used. I mm. haven't seen that myself. Okay. But he, he hasn't been. He called, he called them crooks. Well, uh, the, uh, well yeah, yeah, allegedly, yes. <laughs> yeah. So he, he, he appears to have said something like that. Mm. Now, um, I think that perhaps you can uh, take that in the spirit in which it's offered. Right. You know, accept that as part of the heat of the moment. Okay. Now, wh whoever wins, mm. again, it would be important to. Uh, uh, do the, 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 the good luck, Jonathan, in this case. Okay. I think Africa, particularly now that you have uh, got your country to a point where the whole world is not full of praise, praise yeah. all of a sudden Kenya is now the, <laughs> is, is now the, Africa, the poster boy for uh, <laughs> democracy, <laughs> for uh, um, Freeze, judicial, judicial, judicial so. you know, development and maturity and political maturity mm -hmm. in Africa. Everybody is praising him, everybody is praising the, the, uh, um, the judiciary in, in Kenya. So fine, I don't think uh, it would be wise to go and poop that party now. Okay. Okay, um, and I believe they won't. Okay, okay. Now let, let's uh, move on to another subject. Now, la last week, uh, Britain's Foreign Secretary Boris Johnson was in Nigeria uh, in a move which analysts say is aimed at forging its post-Brexit links around the world. Uh, during that visit, Mr. Johnson, in company with the uh, International Development Secretary Priti Patel, announced a two hundred million pound package. Uh, for Nigeria as it seeks to manage the catastrophic consequences of Boko Haram's insurgency. We have a report uh, on that for you. Bring that up shortly and then we continue in our discussions here. Watch this. Okay, we'll, we're going to work on bringing that report uh, for you now. But uh, you... We're aware of that. Was it were you? Yes. Okay. I was. Okay. So what what do you make of it? It's these things happen. Shuttle diplomacy is um, is part of uh, what happens when nations are faced with major, you know, policy uh, positions yeah. that they have to take. They have to develop. Yeah. Uh, you would expect that uh, the uh, uh, post Brexit Britain. Yeah will reckon that Nigeria would be a very important partner. Okay, okay, important partner. Hold that thought. Uh, we have that report now. Let's watch that report now. Um, your mics, because... 
In 2019, the United Kingdom is expected to finally exit the EU. But before that date, it is in a hurry to forge post-Brexit ties across the world. So, as British Prime Minister Theresa May headed to Japan on a charm offensive, her Foreign Secretary Boris Johnson and his international development counterpart, Fritje Patel, headed to Nigeria. As Africa's biggest economy, Nigeria is strategically important for the UK's economic survival outside the EU. But they didn't come empty-handed. Boris Johnson announced a fresh £200 million package for Nigeria during a visit to the North East. That package will provide food for more than 1.5 million people, medical help for 20,000 children at risk of dying from severe acute malnutrition and schooling for 100,000 boys and girls. This is to help turn the tide against Boko Haram, uh, get the country back under control, help the Nigerian military. I think we've trained 28,000 troops so far. Straight from his visit to the northeast, and both secretaries are holding this meeting with Niger's vice president in Abuja. The UK obviously views Nigeria as a vital future export market. The thinking of the British is to capitalize on Nigeria's historic connections to the United Kingdom, including its Commonwealth membership. Building up that trade and commercial relationship between uh, the UK and Nigeria. This is an incredible place. Uh, it's the powerhouse of the, uh, of the African economy. Nigeria has become an economic powerhouse because it produces 2 million barrels of oil a day. Britain's exit from the EU means a time will soon come when it has to sign its own trade deals. These ministers are aiming for a significant increase in sales of food, drinks, cars and medicines to Nigeria's rapidly growing middle classes. We're very happy to note that, they, that some of the businesses and investors might be interested in investing in Nigeria. There are some things government will find hard to admit in public, however. One is that doing business here is anything but easy. Corruption is still a big problem as is security. It is no surprise then that most of Boris Johnson's and Priti Patel's time has been devoted to the Northeast. Okay, we still have with us uh, Kachio Kizi. So, uh, what do you make of that visit you were telling me earlier on? Uh, this is interesting. Right. Um, like I said, mm -hmm. it's, uh, these are some of the post-Brexit um, footwork mm -hmm. that need to be put in. It, mm -hmm. It's a lot of work right. coming. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is what Britain does best. Mm -hmm. This is what Britain, you know, is known for. Mm -hmm. And so no matter how Herculean it looks to anybody else, mm -hmm. um, Britain, if anybody can do it, Britain will do it. Right. Okay, so um, Nigeria is important strategically. It's important trade partner, mm -hmm. important uh, regional partner. Uh, more than anything else, and the ties, you know, it's uh, you you you're coming off as you're winning yourself of Europe mm. uh, and and uh, the EU. Mm. Uh, you 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 need to sort of recast yourself with uh, the Commonwealth, mm. you know. Uh, so it's from one uh, clubhouse to another. Yeah. Okay, and so uh, countries like Nigeria, India, South Africa. Yeah. Pakistan, perhaps. Mm. These are very strong, uh, Australia and Canada, of course, mm. very strong allies. Also. So I think um, that, but it, w what I thought was interesting was the focus uh, of the visit on the Northeast. Yeah. Okay, now you would of, of course expect that they would choose to go um, where the pulse and strategic attention of the government is at the moment. But I thought it was significant that they didn't make a policy statement mm. that widens their interest beyond the region. Yeah. That is, uh, I'm British, you know that. <laughs> and so I have learned to um, uh, think deeply about these things. That, that it, it, it wasn't a mistake, I can tell you that. It wasn't a mistake, it was strategic. And because there are issues, discussions that are uh, engaging the nation as a whole, mm. and you would have expected, perhaps, to show some uh, sensitivity towards those, to, to, to perhaps just make a, a, a sort of oblique remark mm. regarding those, to indicate that even though we are not taking a position now, uh, we are aware, mm. and we're thinking about it. Mm. You know? So it's not kept in view, so to speak. Mm. And it's not an accident. Oh, okay. Uh, now, what is in, in, in it? Okay, 200 million pound package for the Northeast, mm. spread over five years. Yes. But beyond that, what can what else can Nigeria expect? But to you gain? need to you need to know you need to read around and see what India is doing. 
If Nigeria doesn't make the most of this, okay, they will regret it. It will be their fault, mm. right? This is, the, the Nigeria is one of the uh, choice brides, if you like, right now. If you, I mean, 200 million package is nothing compared to, you know, uh, the, the, the uh, trade-off. Mm. It really is nothing, okay? The fact is, the important thing is how is Nigeria positioning itself or herself to uh, maximize this opportunity. India is certainly doing that. Mm. Oh yes, and they're letting the world know. Mm. And they're letting Britain know that they're doing that. Mm. Okay, so strategically, you need to know when to play to your strengths. I hope we do know that. Mm. It's good to see the um, sort of old boy network that I'm seeing <laughs> here. Um, the uh, Boris Johnson, Udo, 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 and these are all schoolmates, okay? Right. Old schoolmates. It's good to see that. Mm. Uh, and this is the, these, these are some of the, um, if you like, the extraneous advantages that you draw mm. on in this kind of thing. Those relationships are always there, and they enhance, you know, what you're doing. Mm. Uh, I just hope it's not just about listening to them. It's about placing your own demands on the table. Right. This is the time to do it. Placing your own demands on the table. Final words from Kachi Okize. Thank you very much. You're very welcome, sir. For being on the show with us uh, today. We've been speaking about um, Boris Johnson's visit to Nigeria uh, as the Foreign Secretary of uh, the UK to Nigeria uh, last week. And of course, we've been speaking about the uh, Kenya's politics and the uh, election to come on October the 17th. We're going to keep our eyes on that story and we'll bring you the latest on the program. I am Shagun Ujumu. We're going to end the program on this note. We'll see you again next week. Bye-bye.